Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jeremy Dundon, and today I'll be presenting a overview of the Semantic Endpoint Encryption uh, version 11. First thing to discuss about it would be why to encrypt. So we'll start with, in many cases, it's the law. So whether it's uh, Sarbanes-Oxley or PCI DSS or HIPAA or one of a dozen government regulations, most people that I talk to are encrypting because, uh, at least in part, because it's the law. Uh, secondly, it's your intellectual property, your trade secrets, your data. Uh, that's what's at risk for getting stolen. Uh, and along with the actual loss of assets, there's also the loss to reputation. So um, all of these things go into why you'd be looking for some sort of an encryption solution. So uh, what happens during encryption? Before the drive is encrypted, so in a raw, normal state, you've got a bunch of data sitting there, usually with a Windows partition on it, uh, and a master boot record that tells the computer how to boot. Uh, if someone were to take that drive out of that computer, all the data that's sitting there on the data partition is easily readable. Uh, additionally, if you were to boot to one of the many uh, boot disks out there that can change passwords, um, you could actually potentially boot into the user's session, open up their email, and read whatever sensitive records exist in their email. So what we do about that is that we wrap the entire drive in 256-bit AES encryption, and we force the... A, the system has to be booted via that drive, but B, the entire boot process has to go through our secured pre-boot environment, and the user is required to log on with the usual Windows credential of the person who would normally be using that system. Uh, thanks to something called single sign-on, the user is not going to be required to remember an additional set of usernames and passwords, uh, nor are they going to be required to log on to both our pre-boot environment and then Windows. Uh, we will verify their credentials at pre-boot and pass them off to Windows as Windows boots, so that at the end of the process, the user winds up at their Windows desktop. I'm going to go a little bit out of order here and talk about the user experience before I talk about recovery options. So first thing the user is going to see when they boot up their computer is this splash screen. It's going to let them know that there is encryption software in place and that uh, without being able to log on to the system, they're not going to be able to read that data. So when the user presses a key to continue, they're going to wind up at a logon screen that is very similar to a Windows logon screen with the exception that it says cementing point encryption on it. There are buttons here for uh, F1 to help the user, or F4 in case the user has forgotten their password. I'll cover what, exactly what those do a little bit later. Under recovery options. So we've got three main options for access when a user is sitting at the computer and they need to be able to boot it up and satisfy that boot guard. The first would be local self-recovery. So as the administrator via policy, you can define one, two, or three questions that the users are guided through answering at the time that the software is installed. That way later, after a four-day weekend or something, they can come back to that system when they've forgotten their password, choose the local self-recovery option, and answer those questions and regain access to the computer without having to call the help desk, without having to involve an administrator. Here they are, they were able to log on. Second option, to assist that user in getting access to that system. Maybe it's not the normal user of the system, or maybe they can't remember their local self-recovery questions, but the second option would be help desk assisted recovery. So the user engages help desk recovery, it prompts them to call the help desk. On the back end, the help desk personnel will open up the help desk recovery program that's included with the management console, and after they've verified that the employee is who they say they are, they'll be able to exchange codes back and forth to unlock that computer system. The third method is primarily used by administrators. It is the administrator's unlock. Uh, it revolves around the idea that built into that pre-boot environment, there are administrative accounts that are used for unlocking the system, for any type of maintenance that needs to be done, or any of the command line functions of the encryption. So 
on the prior screen, the user logon screen, this is what happens when a user presses F4 because they have forgotten their password. They're going to be prompted to choose either help desk recovery or self recovery. Very limited menu selection here, hard to get the wrong thing. For self recovery, this is what it looks like. These are the questions that they've already answered back when the software was installed and they were in Windows. Hopefully they can remember those answers because once they go through those, that's going to unlock the system. This is what the help desk recovery system looks like for the end user. They're told exactly what their computer name is. Most likely they don't know it. And then they're given a sequence number as well. These are items that the help desk person is going to need on the other end as they feed it into their information. So the end user will supply them with this computer name and that sequence number, and they'll exchange this challenge key back and forth, and that's what unlocks the system. And lastly, hidden behind the F5 key, where the user is prompted to press F1 for help or F4 for forgot their password, administrators will know that you can hit F5 and be able to log in as one of those client administrator accounts that I mentioned earlier, so that if the asset has been returned because the employee has left the company, or if you need to walk around and install some software and the user's not around to log in for you, uh, log in via the admin logon, and that satisfies Preboot. Because these accounts aren't tied into Active Directory or the local computer in any way, typing your login here only satisfies the preboot requirement. It does not actually log on to Windows, so there'll be a separate Windows authentication for this method. So what about reporting? This comes back to compliance. So the main reason that anybody encrypts is going to be that they've got to satisfy a board or an audit of some type that the encryption has happened. So here is reporting. There are a ton of reports here. Uh, they can get very, very granular. Uh, my personal favorite would be the percentage of encrypted endpoints. Uh, you can see here in my demo environment that out of my four computers, zero of them were encrypted. So it's an alarming red color. Uh, but that's a very quick overview of out of your environment, how many computers are encrypted. If none of the pre-canned reports have exactly the information you're looking for, you can build a custom report and you can get very, very granular about exactly what you'd like to see a report on, uh, save it, and run it at will. Thank you. Uh, again, I've been Jeremy Dundon, and this was the Semantic Endpoint Encryption 11 Solution Overview.